Hi, I'm Steve Halliday and this is our seventh video on bare metal programming for the Raspberry Pi. In our previous video, you may recall, we learned how to do subroutines for the ARM processor. And in this video, what we're going to do is say hi to the world. It's been a long time coming to do a hello world program for a Raspberry Pi, but we finally have enough pieces in place that we can actually send hello world out the serial port to our terminal emulator. We won't actually do hello world, we'll do just hi repeating over and over. And then in the next video, we'll look at how to make it a little bit easier to send longer strings. This video has taken me a while to put together. The reason is I've been stuck on a bit of a problem in this video. And I'll make an offer at the end of the video. I still haven't solved the problem, but the first person that can help me solve this problem by showing me how to fix my code I will give you three things. I will give you fame and honor, and I'll actually send you a free Raspberry Pi. So stay tuned till the end of the video, and I'll make that offer available to you. Printing Hello World to the terminal emulator in bare metal programming isn't quite as easy as, say, opening a socket and just pushing a string out the socket. Instead, what we'll need to do is learn to program the UART. The UART used to be an independent chip, but nowadays it's just a hardware component within a chip. And what it does is it takes in eight bits in parallel and then sends the bits out one at a time in serial mode. The bits then are transmitted along the serial line to our terminal emulator that interprets these bits as characters. Normally, programming the UART is part of the operating system functionality, but in bare metal programming, we are the operating system. So let's take a look at how we do that. This is what data looks like as it travels along the serial line. In this picture here, the line when it's low represents low voltage values and when it's high it represents a high voltage value. And so the way we transmit bits is with a high value, so these bits represent ones. With the low value, they represent zeros. So here are some ones, here are some zeros, some more ones, some more zeros, a one, and then a couple more zeros. And here's the way we read these bits. The first bit is a start bit. This tells the receiving mechanism when this line goes high here that they can start sampling. And then the receiving mechanism will sample at a regular interval based on the baud rate. And so these represent those regular intervals of sampling. Once the UART transmits the start bit, then it begins to transmit data bits. In this example, these are the bits I'm transmitting. So you'll see these first three ones here, and then a couple of zeros, a couple of ones, a couple more zeros, and then finally the, the last one here. Once the data bits are complete, the UART will optionally transmit a parity bit. You can either enable or disable parity. If the parity is enabled, what happens is the UART will count the number of ones that occur in the data. In this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six ones. And since I'm running in this example with odd parity, if the parity is odd, it'll set a one here. If it's not odd, then it'll set a zero here. So this is zero because I have six or an even number of ones in my data. And then finally, a stop bit, which has to be the opposite value of the start bit so that the receiving mechanism can notice the transition on the next byte. Now that we know what we're trying to get the UART to do, let's look at how we might do that. There's two links that you want to take a look at here. This first link I've shown you before, this is the Raspberry Pi peripherals document. It explains all the peripherals of which the UART is one. By the way, UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, in case you care. Uh, and so this document in chapter 13 explains the UART that we're going to be working with. Turns out there's two UARTs on the Raspberry Pi. There's also one that the document discusses in chapter 2, but that's the mini UART. We won't be using that. We'll be using the UART in chapter 13. And then here's another link. This is a tutorial written in C that talks about how to program the UART. So we can look at this to try and understand how to do it. Frankly, I'm not much of a UART expert, and so I use this tutorial to try and follow along and figure out what I want to do in assembly. Here is chapter 13 of the peripherals guide, and this chapter discusses the UART, so you can read about it here and its functionality. But to control the UART, it turns out that we actually have several registers that we can use to read and write from and to. 
to be able to get the UART to do what we want to do. And this section is a table of contents that explains what all the different registers are. And then down below here, there's a section for each of the different registers. Now let's take a look at the actual code that we'll use to write to the UART. I provided the code for you here, unlike previous exercises, because this is a little bit hard to figure out. The code actually consists of three pages here that I will show you. The first two initialize the UART, and then the final page is the loop that actually prints the characters. Our assembler can already handle all the instructions in the code that I'm going to show you, so there won't be any additions to our assembler at this point. The first thing we need to do is set up the GPIO base register. This is like we did in the previous video. As you may recall, the pins we hook up to the terminal emulator are the GPIO pins, so we're going to need to make sure that the GPIO pins are set up appropriately. We also need to set the UART base in register 1 here. That's what this does. Basically, the UART base is just a thousand hex below the GPIO base, and then all the registers for the UART are accessed relative to this UART base. So here what we'll do is we'll completely disable the UART, and that's what the, these two lines do. We write a zero, remember we move the zero into register two, and then we write it to 30 hex off the base, which is 20201000. So it'll be 30 off of that base. We're going to write the zero that's in register two, based on the base address, plus 30. Then these two lines here are for, or these three lines actually, are, are for setting up the GPIO pins like I talked about. And then finally here, we start to do some configuration on the UART. So the first thing we're doing here is we're actually writing to the ICR register for the UART. Here we are in chapter 13 of the peripherals manual in the section on the ICR register. This section explains that the ICR register is an interrupt clear register, which we can use to clear interrupts. You'll see back in our code here at the bottom where we're writing this value, we write a 7FF, which basically means that we're going to clear all interrupts for the UART at this point. Here's the next page of the initialization code. You'll notice that the first thing we do on this page is we write to this IBRD register and the FBRD register. If we look at the peripherals manual again, we'll see that the IBRD and FBRD registers are used for setting the baud rate. Here's the description of what these registers actually mean. You go through this kind of nasty calculation where you use the UART clock speed and you divide that by 16 times the baud rate. In our case, we're, we're using 115200 for the baud rate. And the UART clock is 3 million. Now you're probably wondering how we know that the UART clock is 3 million. Well, that's a good question. I've tried to research this and find out where it is in the documentation. I think what we found out is that it actually isn't documented anywhere. It comes from the Linux source code seems to be the only place that anybody's found the documentation for this. Once we do this calculation, the result has an integer portion and a remainder portion. We write the integer portion to the IBRD register, and we write the remainder portion times 64 to the FBRD register. And I'll show you where in our example code we actually found that. If we look at the tutorial and we go into the UART initialization routine that he wrote in C, he explains this division a little bit more carefully. In our case, where we're using 115200 as the baud rate and 3 million as the UART clock rate, this gives us a 1.267 division result, which is if we take the integer portion is roughly 1. The remainder is 0.267, which is the 0.267 from here, times 64, and he rounds it off, which gives us roughly 40. So back in the code, we see that we write the 1 to the IBRD, and then we write the 40 to the FBRD, which should set our baud rate at 115200. Next, we write to the LCRH register. We're going to write bits 4, 5, and 6. Let's take a look at the LCRH register in the peripherals guide. So here we see that the LCRH register is a line control register, and we're writing bits 4, 5, and 6 here, which enables the FIFOs, 
you remember that I told you that you can write bytes in parallel and then read the bits serially, we can actually write bytes such that we can write more bytes than we've actually transmitted and they get queued up in the FIFO here. And then bits 5 and 6 here, we're using a 1-1 one, one, which says we're going to transmit 8 data bits. Back in the code, we see that the next thing we do is we write to this IMSC register. This is an interrupt mask register, so we're turning off any interrupts. We don't care about those at this point. And then finally, we will write to the control register here. This will turn on the UART. And if we look at the control register again, we see that we're writing bits 0, 8, and 9. Bit 0 enables the UART. Bits 8 and 9, turn on, transmit, and receive. Here we are back in the code again on the second page of the initialization code. I failed to mention up here, you may have noticed that I have these branch with link. These are subroutine calls to a subroutine called delay, and we'll see that in the next page here. But this brings us to the end of the UART initialization code. Now let's continue on to the next page here. Here's the subroutine for the delay. This is basically the same subroutine we used in the previous video. All it does is loop many times to kill some time for us. The main loop in this section of code runs from here down to here. And all we're doing each time through the loop is we're writing out an H, we delay for some time, we write out an I, delay for some time, and then we write out a space and then delay a little bit and jump back up and do it over again. By looping like this, we can turn on the Raspberry Pi and have it spitting out these characters and then we can go and get our terminal emulator working. The way that we print out characters is we load the character into register 2 and then we store that character at the UART base address. So a hex 48 is the ASCII character for an H, hex 49 is a lowercase i, and then a hex 20 is the ASCII character for a space. And so when we run this, we'll see this looping over and over. Here's my terminal emulator I'm about to run so that we can look at the Raspberry Pi output. But before I do, I want to explain one thing to you about this terminal emulator. I promised you that I would make an offer to you at the end of this where I would offer you fame and honor and free Raspberry Pi for the first person to solve this problem for me. The problem is that right here I've had to tell my terminal emulator that I only want seven data bits. If I don't do that, I seem to be getting an odd parity bit in my data and I don't understand why. I've reviewed the documents quite a bit and I'm not able to resolve what's causing this problem. So if you can help me solve this problem so that I'm not seeing the odd parity bit in my data so I don't have to tell it to only use the seven data bits, then I'll send you a Raspberry Pi. I'll mention you on my next video and uh, I'll give you the honor of having solved that problem for me. So for all the marbles, here goes. So there we have it, a success. We're able to print Hello World and it only took us seven videos. If you think you can solve my parody problem, feel free to send me the code updates that you think I need at sumpyguy at gmail.com. Or if you have other questions or comments that you'd like to make or things you'd like me to address in future videos, you can also email me at sumpyguy.com. I look forward to working with you in future videos.